Sequence start. We got it all, flight green Got go. Waiting for guidance steering at two minutes. Any Where go, Where go, flight? Tell come. Go, flight. Surgeon. All right, 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. But because they are on. Shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Three on back and forward. Just. Contact light. Fifty years ago, President Kennedy challenged Americans to redefine the realm of possibility by sending a man to the moon and returning him home safely. Now President Kennedy's nephew, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, a longtime advocate of mental health care for all Americans, has issued a new challenge. He's calling for another moonshot, but this time to the inner space of the human brain. Let's learn more with Patrick Kennedy and Garen Staglin. Patrick, Garen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jeff. And I want to jump right into this exciting initiative. Well, everybody knows and acknowledges that the last medical frontier of discovery for research is brain research. And uh, 50 years ago, when my uncle was first inaugurated as president, and he spoke about a new frontier. Um, it was an image of how do we tackle the biggest challenges in, in the world. At that time, the nuclear arms race, um, the, the Sputnik challenge that the Russians had offered and putting the first kind of satellite in space. Uh, provided an impetus for us to technologically as a nation come together uh, to do what at the time no one thought was possible and that was to put a man on the moon before the decade was out and return him safely. That's what John F. Kennedy said. We're going back to this um, metaphor of the moonshot in order to capture people's understanding that it's going to take everybody working together in order for us to achieve a national goal of such importance. Uh, the moonshot could never have been done by any individual company or special interest. It had to be a national goal that encompassed everybody's efforts. And research to go to inner space, to the brain, is going to require that same level of collaboration and uniformity in terms of everybody working together. And that is the kind of message we want to focus on brain research with a singular mission like we had when we went to the moon. And we want it to be defined just as it was back then by a national urgency. In this case, the suicide rates of our nation's heroes, both in the battle, because our suicide rates amongst existing soldiers are so high, as well as our veterans. Their trauma as a result of serving our nation and protecting us is what is now coming home to all Americans and, and opening up all of our minds, if you will, to the impact of untreated uh, neurological disorders. I prefer to call them neurological because I think the, we're l learning more and more so quickly that psychiatric disorders, frankly, are neurological. And, and uh, I know they're interchangeable the disorders words. disorders of the brain. It's exactly. The brain. But the, the point is, is that we need to understand them as the physical illnesses that they are, no different than any other part of the body. And so by understanding these illnesses, we'll destigmatize, if you will, this notion that mental illnesses are something of in the purview of the moral character of the person that has the mental illness. Mental illnesses that now comprise the biggest morbidity, burden of illness, of any illness that's known to humankind. Jeff, you made yeah. a point there which I think is important to make is that 10 years ago that probably was the story, that it wasn't possible. But in the last 10 years the science has advanced to the point that the time is now. We have the science today. We have the Genome Project, which has given us a roadmap that we never had before inside the brain. We've actually now got technologies that allow us to illuminate circuits inside the brain, to actually see what's malfunctioning and where. The advances in computer technology and uh, bioinformation has allowed us to 
be able to process this data and understand what genes are impaired in these illnesses and which aren't. Uh, and from that information, move forward towards the idea of small molecule therapies so we can actually fix what's wrong with these genetic disorders, which are environmentally triggered, to Patrick's point. No one did anything wrong. These are not diseases of character. They're diseases of the gene. It's beyond the person's control that they it's exactly ended right. up having those conditions. It's not a parental problem. It's not an individual's problem. You're not going to just suck it up and be better. So today we have medications. Tomorrow we'll have cures. Tell me more about the plans to bring this together. Well, this is essentially a political issue of will. Willpower is going to be what determines whether we tackle this problem with the initiative that we need in order to get the results. We need to make this a national security endeavor because if we do, we mobilize the effort in a way that cannot be done individually for every separate neurological disorder. And frankly, the, what the soldier is suffering from we all know that because of their trauma, whether it's um, psychological, it's really physical because of cortisol pumping through the brain and the impact that it has, or it's, it's physical and the trauma through traumatic brain injury, they are going to suffer from much higher burdens of these neurological disorders, whether it's perhaps Alzheimer's earlier in life or Parkinson's or any number of disorders in addition to what they're already suffering um, through the, the many stories we've read about suicide rates and the like. Without treatment, it's only going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And furthermore, there's not a reason for us to wait for answers. The answers may be there already, and we don't know it, because we're not sharing the information that's out there. Pharmaceutical companies aren't sharing. Government is bifurcated and in many ways siloed in its approach. Academia and even philanthropic efforts in the private sector are all stifling the advancement that we could achieve if we all work together. Now the idea is how do we create a new mousetrap that the process of which allows us to get greater results because of what we set up as a means by which we can share the information and get to the advancements that are there if we all knew what we were doing at the same time. But we don't right now, is unfortunately the case. With the idea being that we can actually cure these conditions, not just relieve symptoms, but look toward the cure for these Now, conditions. people will say to me, Congressman, that's a very ambitious goal. That's too big. And back in the 60s, when my uncle spoke about the moonshot, he said, we don't do these things because they're easy. We do them because they're hard. That was the moniker of a generation that believed we could do whatever we set our mind to. We have to have that idea now because if I'm at home as a veteran and suffering and I can't go outside because of my post-traumatic stress disorder or I have headaches, chronic headaches, or I have something, why should I be imprisoned? Because someone hasn't come and knocked on the door and said, here are some possible therapies or cures that can help you live again in a full integrated way with the rest of America. You stood the line for us. Isn't it time that we're there for you to save you from the debilitation uh, that they're debilitating effects that they're suffering as a result of their service to our country? I think there's no excuse for making these soldiers and veterans wait. My uncle also spoke in the 60s about the civil rights uh, challenge that we had at the time, and we continue to always have. But he said, who amongst us would trade the color of their skin and be content with the counsels of patience and delay? Who amongst us would want to change your shoes if that is someone who is a veteran suffering from their neurological disorders, where if you said, oh, well, we'll get to that cure. Well, wait a second. If I'm the person that's suffering, you don't want to wait. For why the cure. do you want to mm -hmm. wait? And all of us need to look at this as these soldiers could be our family members. And in most cases in America, they are. Why do we want to make them 
wait a day longer because we're not in it to win it in the sense that we're going to get them the cure as if it was war. And the answers depended on a quick, urgent response time to their wounds. And the benefit is not just helping the servicemen and women who have served our country and their families, but all people who have conditions that are related to these brain disorders. So it, the, it, it would help so many people to get to this The basic goal. science that is involved in the One Mind Next Frontier campaign will do just that, Jeff. So this is a very grand plan, and it's, it's unprecedented in terms of what we are trying to accomplish and are in the midst of accomplishing. And that is, for the first time ever, a national plan agreed on by every research scientist, university, and laboratory in the country. A 10-year plan, not a one-year plan, a 10-year plan with over 150 separate important discovery elements in it. And it involves all of the directors of the NIH who are involved in brain disorders. Uh, and as I said, every research uh, university it involves the major neurological organizations, the Society for Neuroscience, there's 40,000 members of that, the American College of Neuropharmacology, I believe there's over 20,000 members of that, the Institute of Medicine, Neuroscience Forum, Forum, the Dana Institute, all are participating, collaborating, and approving, basically, this plan in a collaborative way that Patrick is describing and move this project forward with very clear accountabilities and time frames. Garen, you obviously have a passion for this, and to a large degree that's from a, an experience that your family has had. Yes. And I'd like to ask you to share that. Our son Brandon, typical of the incident timing of schizophrenia, when he was 19 years old, between his freshman and sophomore year in Dartmouth, had a psychotic break. It was devastating to us. Uh, this was about 17, 18 years ago. Um, we thought the phone call was a wrong number. It couldn't possibly have been our son. Uh, this high-functioning person who now was basically lost. We made a choice um, to, instead of turning away or running away from that problem, to run towards this problem. So for the last uh, 17 years, we have been advocates to raise awareness, uh, uh, reduce the stigma, which comes from the lack of understanding that these are neurological disorders, and to raise significant funds for research. This One Mind campaign actually is about all disorders. So it's from autism to Alzheimer's. So it's every one of these elements. All age groups. All age groups. All of the major all, conditions that all affect All the major people. conditions. And we believe that the basic science that I just described to you will accrue to the benefit of all those illnesses. And hence, all of these advocacy groups are also joining with us, not just the research, because they believe that it will give us one voice to talk to the American public about. And we need to go at this in a bigger picture, holistic way, because... Uh, what we find for a cure for someone like myself who suffers from anxiety and depression and addiction, a lot of the medications that have come about for people like myself have been a result of research that was done on, on epilepsy or another kind of neurological disorder. The notion that there isn't cross-benefit between the research in one area and the research in another ignores what we're already learning and what we know common sense tells us that this is one brain it's not an Alzheimer's brain and a Parkinson's brain and an epilepsy brain and a depressed and uh, brain affected by schizophrenia it's the same brain and research in any one of these disorders can accrue to the advantage of everybody so it's a common idea it's not a new idea but unfortunately, it's not the modus operandi right now when it comes to applied research for neuroscience. We're still in stovepiped mentality. We're still siloed. We have great leaders out there. Tom Insel, others have been trying to break down these silos. But, you know, we need to help and do whatever we can politically to create an environment that enhances the advantage for everybody of a combined effort. And my view is, is that the soldier, 
suffering as they do because of their service to us, the signature wound of this war is traumatic brain injury, that they need to be the, the catalyst for us to use this new idea of combined research to the benefit of their efforts to find cures for traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. And frankly, a lot of research is out there in the private sector that could benefit the soldier. So uh, that isn't being made available to the Department of Defense and VA the way it needs we, to be. How can we make it more available? How do we bring, begin to bridge those gaps and, and bring that information? It's really process is really what we're looking so, at because by putting a new process of integrated sharing of research, we get a new product. And the product is a better product, a quicker product, and one that's going to end up relieving the burden of illness for hundreds of millions of Americans, our soldiers first and foremost, to our newest population of those suffering, and, but all the world ultimately. And isn't that something America should strive for? Patrick, you spoke about your own experiences and you've really been very open and part of how I think you've helped a lot of people is by sharing your experience. I'd like to ask you, what has it been like for you to share your own personal experience with um, anxiety, depression, addiction? Well, I've been blessed because I've had a great support system and anybody who's been suffering from any neurological disorder knows that the family around them, the community around them makes all the difference. You can have great molecules as we're working on now, but you also need to have great love, great support and compassion. And um, what I have been the beneficiary of is not only a good health care insurance system, but part of the process of making that insurance system better for all that has been one of the great uh, achievements that I feel proud to have been part the of in the, in the Congress, and that is achieving um, the Mental Health Addiction and Equity Act of 2008, which requires that insurance companies no longer treat uh, the brain as if it's not part of the body for purposes of insurance coverage. So if you have depression, addiction, uh, bipolar, schizophrenia, you're not treated as if it's any different from diabetes or heart disease or cancer. That these are all physical illnesses. And that's part of the reason why we're taking this new approach is because the next step to destigmatize and eliminate the discrimination that's out there towards these diseases is to understand them at their very root biological um, source. And the genetics, the biomarkers, the uh, work that we can do on brain research will help, I think, alleviate the stigma that people feel when they suffer from these disorders. Now, I suffered from mine in public because I was a public office holder. Um, I lived out the symptoms of this and, and accepted the shame that came with it until I did hearings around the country and I learned from people from all walks of life that they were suffering as I had been, but in silence and many of them were an equally discouraged by the public attitudes towards these disorders. And I felt like instead of this being a liability for me politically to suffer from this, um, I knew that it became an asset to me. Um, and of course, for anybody who has ever suffered from these disorders, the connection of a fellow in uh, recovery, um, whatever that is, is something that is the greatest uh, antidote in so many ways. And I benefited not only legislatively from this effort, um, but I benefited personally, which of course is, I'm so grateful to all the people that were there for me. In many ways, your work to help so many people helped you directly as well. Well, as anybody who's been in recovery knows that uh, a, a key element of recovery is helping someone else because that means that you don't have to focus all on your own uh, mm -hmm. problems and, and that is a great lesson of life. Um, and I've been blessed to have been taught that lesson early and learned it firsthand. Often people end up suffering in silence because they're ashamed, because of the stigma right. that exists, and they don't seek the help that could make a big difference in their life. That's why we've got to unveil the mysteries of the brain, do the research, do it with urgency, and set free Americans, not only on a physical disability level, but on an attitudinal 
ability to get people to feel more uh, free to, to uh, get the help they need, uh, to be supported, and uh, to not be treated as if they are outcasts in society. It's that when you hear that term, insult to injury, that's what it is for someone with a neurological disorder because they're already suffering. And then what do we do? We compound it by saying, you're now stigmatized. It's, you know, it's amazing to me in this day and age that we're still so in the Stone Age, if you will, with respect to our attitudes about taking care of something that is so central to every single person's life, whether it's in their own life or their family member's life. There isn't a family that escapes this. And why we're not in it to win it, so to speak, and getting this done with an urgency that is befitting the number of people and the degree of suffering that's going on out there. I just, I can't understand. And your point about adding insult to injury, if the injury is to a service member who had that injury protecting our country, that's, right. that's an extraordinary insult if we don't do something about it. The most basic insult of all. I mean, we talk in my former business as a former member of Congress about entitlements and programs. There isn't a person in our country that is more entitled to everything than the person willing to put their life on the line to defend our freedom. If we can't motivate ourselves to come to their rescue because of this signature wound on the war and traumatic brain injury, PTSD, we don't have a business calling ourselves Americans who are patriotic when we're leaving these soldiers languishing in their homes, suffering, because we're not in it to save them from their traumatic brain injury and PTSD. We talk a good game, but we're not doing everything that we should be. I know it. Everybody who I talk to knows it. We need to bring it together. President Kennedy's moonshot in 1961, we're going to say we need a similar national call to action. Sputnik was the satellite launched by the so Soviets that started that space race. We're going to say the suicide rate of our soldiers should be our generation, Sputnik, that motivates us to do the same as we did back in the 60s. And that's to go to inner space of the brain and return to humanity the advantages that will come from such a scientific discovery. And so today, all we can do is harness the moniker of what he had called for back in the 60s and say, let's do something of equal importance, if not greater importance. Um, neuroscience is also the science of spinal cord tissue and repairing uh, damaged spinal cords. Imagine when Neil Armstrong said those famous words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. If today he could describe this effort on neuroscience for a veteran stepping out of a wheelchair because of a spinal cord injury for the first time, and using those same words, that small step by a veteran, because their spinal cord was repaired by neuroscience, was able to take a step that represented a giant leap for all humanity and our generation. I think that's our moonwalk for our time. I want to thank both of you for the work that you've done, Patrick, over the years, for parity for mental health, for equality of treatment, both of you for the work you've done to reduce stigma. I end each episode by saying with, with help there's hope, and I certainly feel that hope from this conversation. So Next thank you. Show.